It was just another mundane evening, the kind where you find yourself rummaging through old stuff to kill time. That's when I stumbled upon it, a dog-eared faded photo tucked away between the pages of an old volume of Hellblazer. The image was a snapshot from another era, my childhood encapsulated in a 4x6 frame. There we were, the inseparable trio, me, Max, and Sophie, our youthful grins contrasting starkly against the backdrop of the old rusted swing set at Jefferson Park. That photograph was like a portal, dragging me back through time to those carefree days. Jefferson Park, our hideout, our adventure land. But it wasn't the kind of place that you'd find on postcards. No, this park had an otherworldly aura, nestled amidst a row of abandoned houses that had seen better days. Vines crept up the sides of the crumbling facades, and windows, shattered and grimy, gave nothing away of the secrets held within. Our parents always warned us about playing there, said it was unsafe, not just because of the rusty playground equipment, but because of the park's eerie atmosphere and the unsavory characters it attracted. But to us, it was our kingdom, a place where we could rule, explore and imagine, far away from the mundane realities of homework and chores. The legends of Jefferson Park were numerous, stories whispered under blankets, rumors spread in hushed tones around campfires, the most persistent of these was the tale of the Grey Man, a specter said to roam the grounds, preying on the innocence of children. They said he was a shadow, a mist, a figment of overactive imaginations, but his legend was enough to send shivers down our spines. Yet in the brazenness of youth, we deemed ourselves invincible, laughing in the face of danger, mocking the tales that had kept many a child away from the park's foreboding embrace. The sun was always a bit dimmer there, the air a touch colder, as if the place existed under a perpetual cloud. But that day, the day captured in the worn photograph, was different. It was as if the very atmosphere of the park had shifted, becoming more sinister, more anticipatory, as if it knew something we didn't. As I held the photo, those memories, once vibrant and filled with the laughter of the past, now seemed tainted colored by the shadows of events that would unfold in the days to come. Little did we know, our fearless adventures were about to encounter a chilling reality, intertwining our fates with the eerie legend of the Grey Man. But back then, we were just kids, caught between the bliss of ignorance and the precipice of an unknowable darkness. The day had started off like any other during those long, languid summers of our youth. The sun, a hazy orb, fought a losing battle against the gathering clouds, casting an ominous pall over the park that afternoon. Despite the oppressive atmosphere, our spirits were high, fueled by the boundless energy and fearless invincibility that only the young possess. Max, always the ringleader of our little group, had that mischievous glint in his eye, the one that meant he was brewing up some new form of entertainment, likely at our expense. I dare you, he said to Sophie his voice carrying that challenging tone he knew she could never resist. His arms swept grandly towards the swings, located perilously close to the dense thicket of trees where shadows danced and whispered secrets. To go swing in the gray man's lair, he finished with a dramatic flourish. Sophie, never one to back down, scoffed at the notion, tossing her hair with practiced nonchalance. As if I'd believe in such childish tales, she retorted though I caught a fleeting glimpse of hesitation in her eyes. Nevertheless, she marched towards the swings with the kind of bravado only a ten-year-old can muster, leaving Max and me exchanging triumphant smirks. Minutes ticked by, a strange, uneasy silence settling over the park. The usual sounds of nature seemed to mute themselves, as if in anticipation of something momentous. Max and I started with small distractions, flinging stones at abandoned cans, our laughter forced and hollow, trying to mask the growing unease. But as the silence stretched, heavy and unyielding, our games lost their charm. The chill of realization began to set in. Sophie had been gone too long. Our calls for her, initially teasing and lighthearted, grew more frantic, our voices cracking with the onset of real fear. We approached the swings, the very epicenter of our dread, only to find them empty but for one, which swayed gently as though recently vacated. A cold gust of wind seemed to mock us, carrying away our calls for Sophie into the indifferent expanse of the park. 
panic clawed at my insides, a visceral primal thing that I had never experienced before. The Grey Man, once a mere specter of our imaginations, suddenly felt all too real, his presence lurking in every shadow, behind every tree. Max's face, usually so full of confidence and mischief, mirrored my own fear as we ventured toward the tree line, the boundary of our known world and the whispered domain of our nightmares. We called out for Sophie, our voices desperate, betraying the terror that gripped our hearts. The woods seemed to close in around us, the faint light from the overcast sky struggling to penetrate the dense canopy above. Every rustle, every snap of a twig underfoot sent jolts of fear through our bodies. We were no longer in our park. We had stepped into a realm where childhood fears were all too real, where legends whispered in the darkness could reach out and touch the living. Sophie emerged from the edge of the woods, her usual vibrant self seemingly drained away, replaced by a silent, pallid figure that barely resembled the friend we knew. Her eyes, once lively and full of mischief, were now hollow, echoing the depth of some unspeakable fear. She moved past us without a word, her gaze fixed on some distant point only she could see. The rest of that day passed in a blur. Max and I attempted to engage Sophie, to break through the shell of her newfound quietude, but our efforts were met with silence. She was physically with us, yet mentally and emotionally. She seemed trapped in a place we couldn't reach, a place painted with the shades of her encounter. That night, after we parted ways, the weight of the day's events pressed down on me like a physical burden. In the days that followed, Sophie's transformation became the talk of our small community. Rumors swirled, some saying she'd seen a ghost, others whispering darker theories. Her parents, tight-lipped and concerned, eventually moved her away, hoping a change of scenery would restore the daughter they once knew. But for those of us left behind, the mystery of her change only deepened the shadows that had begun to stretch over our lives. Max, in particular, took Sophie's departure hard. He became consumed with the legend of the Grey Man, poring over every scrap of information he could find. He was convinced that whatever had taken hold of Sophie in those woods was linked to the spectral figure, and he was determined to prove it. His obsession became his isolation, as one by one our other friends began to distance themselves, unwilling or unable to dive into the depths of the darkness that had ensnared him. I watched helplessly as Max's light dimmed, his once charismatic demeanor replaced by a restless, haunted energy. He spent less and less time at school, more and more in the woods, always searching, always looking for something that remained just out of reach. His absence from our daily lives became the norm, his visits more sporadic and frenzied, his eyes always darting, as if expecting the Grey Man to appear at any moment. Then one day, Max too disappeared, not like Sophie, with a move signaled by a moving truck and tearful goodbyes, but suddenly, inexplicably, his house, once a place of laughter and warmth, stood silent, a testament to the mystery that had enveloped him. The police searched, the community speculated, but no trace of him was found. It was as if the earth had swallowed him whole, leaving only the echoes of his obsession behind. In the aftermath, I found myself alone, haunted not by the gray man, but by the absence of my friends and the shadow of unanswered questions. The park, once a place of joy and adventure, became a monument to loss. A reminder of a childhood interrupted by the inexplicable and the tragic. The laughter and screams of play were replaced by a silence as profound and as deep as the woods that bordered it. A silence that spoke of mysteries unsolved and lives forever altered. Years passed, life moved forward, and the painful memories of that summer began to fade, tucked away in the recesses of my mind like an old, forgotten photograph. But finding that crumpled picture between the pages of my Hellblazer comic stirred something deep within me. A gnawing need for answers that I could no longer ignore. I began my search with a sense of trepidation, knowing that delving into the past could unearth truths that some part of me would rather leave buried. Yet, the faces of Sophie and Max haunted my dreams, their silent pleas for understanding propelling me forward. I started with the internet, poring over old news articles, forum posts, and anything that mentioned the Grey Man or similar disappearances. The legend was more widespread than I remembered, 
with accounts dating back decades, each story chillingly similar to our own. My investigation led me to the local library, where dusty archives held more than just the musty scent of forgotten knowledge. There, I found old newspaper clippings that spoke of other children, other incidents, all linked by whispers of a gray figure looming in the background. It was a pattern of sorrow and loss that painted a picture too significant to be mere coincidence. Armed with this new information, I reached out to those who had also known Sophie and Max, seeking out their perspectives and any details they could remember. Most were reluctant to speak, as if the mere act of recalling that summer could awaken something best left dormant. Yet, from the fragments of their stories, a clearer image began to emerge, one that connected our experience to a deeper, more disturbing narrative. The breakthrough came unexpectedly, from an old man who had lived in the neighborhood since before I was born. He remembered the Gray Man, not as a legend, but as a tangible presence that had plagued our town for generations. He spoke of a time when children knew better than to wander near the woods, of a darkness that fed on innocence and left only shadows in its wake. His tale was one of caution, tinged with the regret of someone who had seen too much and understood too late the true nature of the monster in their midst. Fueled by these revelations, I returned to Jefferson Park, now more ruins than the playground of my memories. It was there, amidst the decay of my childhood sanctuary, that I felt the closest to understanding the events that had ripped my world apart. I could almost see us there, three friends on the cusp of a mystery too big for our minds to comprehend, playing out the last scenes of our shared innocence. As I stood there, the line between the past and present blurred, and I realized that my quest for answers was not just about solving a mystery, it was about reclaiming a part of myself lost to the shadows of those woods. The truth I knew was somewhere out there, woven into the fabric of the legend that had haunted our town for generations. It was a truth I was now determined to uncover, not just for Sophie and Max, but for all the children who had once laughed and played under the watchful gaze of the Gray Man. As the days turned into weeks, my investigation into the Gray Man became all-consuming. The more I uncovered, the less I slept, my nights filled with restless dreams where whispers in the dark echoed the fears I tried to suppress by day. Each piece of the puzzle only served to deepen the mystery, drawing me further into an obsession that mirrored Max's final days. But it was the figure at the bus stop that marked the turning point, the moment my quest shifted from an external search to an internal battle. The sight of him, or it, standing there, so still, so silent under the wan glow of the streetlight, was a chilling affirmation of the fears that had begun to claw at the edges of my consciousness. The figure was distant yet unmistakably marked by the pallor of death, a specter from a nightmare pulled into the tangible world. The days following that sighting were filled with a palpable tension. I could feel the weight of unseen eyes watching me, following me as I moved through my daily life. The world around me took on a surreal quality, as if at any moment the fabric of reality could tear away to reveal the hidden horrors lurking just beneath the surface. I knew then that I couldn't face this alone. This was bigger than me, bigger than any of us who had once played under the indifferent gaze of those gnarled trees. I reached out, first hesitantly, then with growing urgency, to online communities, local historians, anyone who might share this burden who could help piece together the legend that had ensnared our lives. The community's response was a mix of skepticism and fear, but among the voices were others like mine, those touched by the gray man's shadow, seeking answers, seeking closure. Together, we began to compile our findings, mapping out sightings, disappearances, and any strange occurrences that seemed more than mere coincidence. Each story, each testimony, was a thread in a larger tapestry that depicted a horror rooted in reality. And yet, as we drew closer to some semblance of truth, the more elusive it seemed. It was as if the gray man himself was a ghost in the machine, a legend that slipped through our fingers the tighter we tried to grasp it. But this collective effort, this banding together of souls marked by similar tragedies, offered a different kind of closure one not rooted in answers, but in shared experience and mutual support. Tonight, as I sit here, recounting the events that have led me to this moment, I realize that some mysteries are not meant to be solved, not completely. 
but in seeking them out, in facing the darkness, we find not just fear but also the light of community, of shared human experience. The figure at the bus stop has not returned since that night, but the imprint of its presence lingers, a reminder of the thin veil between the known and the unknown. I no longer look for the gray man. Instead, I focus on the here and now, on rebuilding the sense of safety and normalcy that was once stripped away. But let this story serve as a cautionary tale, a call to action for those who recognize the shadows lurking at the edge of their own memories. You are not alone. Reach out, share your story, and listen to those of others. Together we can confront the past, illuminate the shadows, and reclaim the light. Stay vigilant, stay connected, and most importantly, stay safe.